26 to 38. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who has said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary said, answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Let us pray. 
O Lord God, who came to dwell among us, may you dwell with us here and now in this place. May your spirit be ever as much a powerful motivator in our hearts and our lives today that we too might give ourselves in love and service to God. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So just to recall the, the themes of the past three weeks uh, in the down-to-earth study that we've been doing as, um, throughout the church, I hope uh, that has been a meaningful study for you as it as meaningful for you as it has for me um, in the first week we of our advent study we remembered and gave thanks for god's down-to-earth love uh, a love that came into our world through a, a special yet very miraculous birth a love that captures and changes hearts one person at a time a love that seems insignificant yet it is a mountain quaking love a love that would shake the foundations of the world and Jesus that child that love child that was born so long ago would grow up to embody that love and he would surrender his very life out of love for you and for me and for all the world a down-to-earth love the second week of our Advent journey, we considered what a down-to-earth humility might look like. Jesus, and therefore God, accepts this role of humble servant. And this is how you and I also make room in our hearts for the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, to, to reside within us, to guide us, to direct us, to, to remind us that we are loved. John the Baptist, who prepares the way for God, reminds us that we can only live a humble life if we repent and be open and honest with this God who loves us. And then, and only then, will there be space in our lives and in our hearts for the Spirit to live and to guide us. Our hearts will treasure the very things that God treasures. This is a down-to-earth humility. And then in the third week of our Advent study, we considered what a spirit-inspired life might look like. A down-to-earth lifestyle, as we read about in the study. A down-to-earth lifestyle is not something that you and I choose, like the clothing that we wear or how we cut our hair or what, what little hair we have. Um... It's not styling our lives like we style other things in our life or choose other things in our life. Rather, it's pattering, pattering, pattering our lives after those things that make the world a better place. A down-to-earth lifestyle is a life of service to others not to ourselves. Jesus demonstrates this lifestyle when he takes a towel and basin and lowers himself and washes the feet of his disciples. A, a down-to-earth lifestyle is not an easy life, but rather a life of service to others on behalf of others. Jesus reminds us he did not come to be served, but to serve. This is a down-to-earth lifestyle that we are called to. And today, we come to our fourth theme in our Advent journey, a down-to-earth obedience. A down-to-earth obedience. Obedience is not a word we particularly use, and I might add, like, these days. It probably wasn't appreciated in Jesus's day either to be obedient but it is a word that the Bible uses often when describing 
our relationship or our connection with God. Why? Why obedience? It's because without obedience, it becomes difficult to follow Jesus and live a spirit-inspired life that is directed by God. Without obedience, we cannot do this. And even though today's parents do not use the word obedience often, I'm, I'm, I'm only, that's kind of a shot in the dark. I don't think a lot of parents use that word. Um, do you? But yet this word obedience, it, it captures really the essence of parent-child relationship. It's appropriate to begin talking about a down-to-earth obedience with Paul's words in his letter to the church of Philippi. Early in his letter, he writes this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill God's good purpose. You see, God does not force us to follow any commandment. God does, however, invite us to choose to follow those commandments and to submit ourselves to God's plan. In a down-to-earth study, Rachel Billups reflects on her own earlier life and how she, how she understood obedience as she was growing up. She understood obedience as something that she needed to do in order to avoid getting caught or to avoid any kind of uh, punishment or uncomfortable kind of situation. If, if we were all honest, we, we probably would admit that practicing our faith is a little bit like that. We, and I, ha I include myself, we, we oftentimes are motivated to be obedient because we want to avoid getting caught or we want to avoid um, upsetting God or doing something that, that might uh, upset God in some way. But our God is one who reminds us that there's a desire that when we give, we give with a cheerful heart, not begrudgingly. In the season of, of Christ, Christmas, I, I can't imagine, you know, giving a gift begrudgingly to someone. But sometimes that does happen. I remember a, a few years ago, I, I was in conversation with a man and he was telling me about his life and he told me about how he gave a gift to his estranged wife. Um, they were still together, but they were, not, they, were, they were at odds with each other most of the time. And so he told me about a particular Christmas when he and his wife, they gave gifts to each other. And, and he told me particularly about his gift that he gave to his wife. And he said, I, I spent hundreds of dollars on fishing equipment. He said, fishing pole, all of the, all the equipment, uh, you know, needed to fish, a net, different lures, all, all kinds of stuff, everything having to do with fishing equipment. He said, I, I spent literally hundreds of dollars on these things. And he said, I gave them to my wife on Christmas. And he said, I knew that she hated fishing. She hated it. And so I gave her all these gifts. And I don't remember what he told me that his wife 
gave to him in return, but it was something along the same lines. It was, you know, uh, something that he did not and would not enjoy at all. You see, God does not want for us to give our lives in that manner. True obedience, like true love, has to be motivated by gratitude for what has been given to us or done for us. This is so true with Mary. We hear it in, in her words and in today's reading, with all my heart, I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God, my Savior. He has looked with me, looked to me with favor. He has looked on the low status of his servant. The mighty one has done great things. And Mary goes on to say, let it be with me as you have said. Notice Mary does not say, if I'm obedient, then the mighty one will do great things for me. No, it's the mighty one has done great things for me. I will magnify the Lord. It's true that when we are obedient, God's blessings will indeed flood our lives. But it's also true that with true obedience to God, we will, every now and then, we'll find ourselves facing some rather large challenges. <laughs> Mary's life was blessed and would be filled with challenges of raising a child who was destined to save the world. He was fully and completely dedicated to God's plan of salvation. And that would take Mary into some difficult places. Most difficult of, of all would be when she would watch him, his life slip away on behalf of the love that he was delivering. You see, obedience is not for the avoidance of pain and suffering or to avoid punishment. Obedience is nothing more than an opportunity for you and me to fulfill God's good purpose in and through us. What, what might that look like for us and for the world around us? I have a hunch and it's based on faith because I don't know for sure. But I trust that the more we are obedient to God who loves us, the more love we will feel and the more love others will feel because of it. May it be so for us in this season of Advent as we prepare to celebrate the wonder of God's love that came into our world so long ago and that love never left, is still here with us today. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your life-changing love. Help us to give ourselves willingly to that love, willingly to your purpose for our lives and for the world in the season of Advent and Christmas, O oh God, fill us with that spirit that brings us joy, that brings hope in our hearts and in the hearts of those around us, that brings light in a world that sometimes is in darkness. We thank you, O oh God, for calling out to us, for coming to dwell among us, and for your willingness to live through us. What a joy 
that is when we give ourselves to you. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.